Hey developers, Stefan here from BioPython Dev. We're here to talk about functional versus object-oriented programming in Python. Uh, one of the first questions we're going to start with is Python an object-oriented language? Um, well, Python is an interpreted language. It's interpreted by a C Python interpreter normally, and this interpreter maps everything from Python into C objects. So in that sense, uh, it's very easy to work with objects inside of Python and declare classes and work with those as a way to store state about your data. And then the next question, um, can you do functional programming in Python? Well, the answer to that is uh, yes, you can. Uh, you can create pure functions. You can pass functions into other functions, which is another attribute of a functional oriented language like Haskell, 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 <laughs> whatever it's called, that, that language is functional. I generally work with object-oriented languages um, in my day-to-day -day job, and that's uh, C++, C Sharp, Java, and like we talked about already, Python, obviously. So with that out of the way, let's talk about the differences between a functional-oriented language and a object-oriented language. Uh, first, we have this thing, which we will consider this as an object. So an object is consists of variables that hold state, and it consists of functions. So obviously, we take this apart, <laughs> and we have just a bunch of functions. In a functional language, the functions are generally pure functions, which means it just takes a set of inputs and puts out a set of outputs uh, without mutating the inputs at all. Um, functions generally work with immutable data. Uh, the examples of that is if you declare a list in Python, a list is mutable because you can change the values at certain indexes. Uh, if you create a tuple, a tuple is immutable you can't actually change a value at the number one index or so on and so on. Generally, to make Python behave more functional, you work with tuples instead of lists. Uh, you can pass in tuples into your functions, and then you can get the outputs. Uh, maybe you have a tuple of numbers, and you want to add those together as your output, and that would be the output. All right, so in Python, if you want your classes to have a good design, uh, generally it's good to follow the solid principles. Uh, you can read about that more online. I'm not going to go into it in too much detail here. Just Google solid design principles. Stuff will come up. Uh, the most important thing from that is kind of the single responsibility principle. So what it means for a class to have a single responsibility is that, for example, if you have a person class, the data stored in the class is all related to the person, like the height, first name, last name, their email address. And then the methods within that person class all operate on the data accordingly. Uh, so you might have a retrieve last name, a change email address function, a set last name uh, in the case where it's a female and they can change your last name. Uh, you might not have start rocket ship because not everyone has a rocket ship and that would not be a good function to include in the person class. And if we go back to the idea where you have individual functions in a functional programming language that depend on your inputs and your outputs and don't mutate state, um, a class would mutate the state of the data inside of that class, and uh, your functions would be very kind of related. So, for instance, you might have a core function package, which, again, like sets and retrieves variables, and then you might have another set of functions which actually operates on the data inside of it and works on that data. For instance, uh, retrieve full name, which will actually get the first name, the last name, maybe even the middle name if that's one of the properties in your class, and then joins them all together. In a solid class, you know, everything fits together uh, real nicely. And with that nice class, you know, it's easier to work with the object. It's easier to extend it for future developers working with the code. Maybe you have some dependency injection which will allow you to unit test it a little better. On the subject of unit testing, another thing about functional programming is it's very easy to test individual functions since they are just dependent on the inputs and the outputs. It's very simple to create a test for it. Whereas with classes, if they're not designed very intuitively, you might have to do a lot of mocking of dependency classes and other things. And as you work more with that, I'm sure you'll understand what I'm talking about. And with all that explanation said, let's jump into the editor. All right, now that we're in the editor, let's write some examples of what functional code would look like. So if we have a function define add uh, x, y, and then we just return x plus y, uh, this would be a pure function um, because it doesn't mutate the data and it returns new instances. 
So if we go ahead and we do uh, print add three and four, we should end up just seeing seven. So let's get rid of this update window. We'll go ahead and run this in the terminal. And we can see we print seven. And this would be using Python as a functional language where you just have functions. Uh, we can do the same thing with define multiply uh, x and y. And I think you guys see where I'm going with this. Uh, x times y. Da, da, da. Go ahead and do the same thing, but instead of running the add function, this time we'll run the multiply function. So now after running that, we see seven from the add and we see 12 from the multiply. Another thing with the functional language is you can pass around functions to other functions. So you can do something like def, um, do math, action, and then x and y. And then here we'll just return, uh, we'll call action with x, y args. I don't really know why you would want to do this, but it's something that Python allows you to do. So you can pass in the add function and we can do add three and four. We'll stick with the same things. And then uh, we actually need to call this function, don't we? And it's not do function, it should be do math. <laughs> and then we can do math here and we can pass in the multiply function and pass in three and four. And we should see the same things. Uh, my arc count is off. Why is this mad? Oh, because this is not, shouldn't actually be calling it. We should be passing in the function. Uh, apparently it's super angry about something. Um, okay. I don't know when I lost that parenthesis. Anyways, so seven, 12, seven, 12. And we passed in this function into the do math function. And then we called it with the passed in args. One of the reasons being able to pass functions around is useful is because you can pass it into threading and concurrency functions. And since these are pure functions and don't depend on state, um, they're not gonna alter any of the variables in memory, which will allow you to spin up multiple Python processes with the inputs and do truly multi-threaded stuff outside of the global interpreter lock. And sometimes when you're trying to do multi-threaded things inside of the same Python process, you run into the global interpreter lock. And instead of getting like 4x gains, if you're using four threads, you might only see like a 1.25 speed up. Those numbers are semi made up, but something I actually benchmarked in real code that I made before. <laughs> so Python does have some really built in functional support with the list comprehension, uh, which if you don't know where that is, if you have uh, my list equals one, two, three, four, and then let's say we want to double every single value in this list, we can do a double list equals uh, two times val for val in my list. And then we can print this. Uh, so we'll print the doubled list. And let's run this real quick. And you can see two, four, six, eight. Uh, basically, this is just taking my list, uh, doing this kind of inline function on the input, and then outputting it here without actually mutating the original list. So just to verify that, I will go ahead and print my list here. And you can see that it's not doubled. One of the really important things about that is uh, Python does have some other kind of functions declared in it that people are familiar with from functional languages, such as map and filter and reduce. Uh, Guido Van Rossen, the creator of Python, isn't a huge fan of those actual actions. Uh, so they used to be global functions in Python, but now they're defined in func tools, I believe. I think one of the one of those two are still in there, but. The reason he's not a big fan of that is because uh, list comprehensions can do everything that those three can do, and it's a lot more Pythonic. Now, if instead of doing these add and multiply pure functions that you would do in the functional programming paradigm, and we want to do this in a more object-oriented way, uh, obviously we would get rid of all of these, and maybe we would have a do math class. Uh, so we'll go ahead and create that. We'll create a constructor that will take our values, um, val1, val2, 
And then we will store these inside of the class. So this is to represent the state of our instance object. And let's go ahead and create the add function that we had before. Uh, and since we need the self-reference, we add that as the first input to our method. So we don't actually need to specify inputs to our add function other than the self, because we're going to use the same numbers that we passed into this class when we created the instance of it. And we're just going to return self.val1 plus self.val2. And then we will also do something similar for multiply. And we'll go ahead and create our math instance using the same examples we used before in the functional coding method. And then instead of having to pass in the args every time, we can just uh, call this. Apparently I put multiple instead of multiply. I'll go ahead and change that real quick. Ooh, and we got a whole bunch of red. What is all this red from? Oh, obviously. Sorry about that. You need self in your constructor function in Python. And if we print this, we get the same seven and 12 we have from the functional example. Uh, the only difference is here, we have state. So we might have something such as a double input, kind of similar to the list comprehension example we had before. But for this, uh, we'll do self.val1 equals self. Actually, I think I could just do times equals two, and then I can do self.val2 times equals two. And then this doesn't actually return anything. It just acts on the state of our class. This would definitely not be something you would write if you're creating a functional coding module, which again, you can do in Python, but you generally don't want to mix your two paradigms in the same class. But in our do math class, you know, this is perfectly acceptable. And now if we do, uh, da -da -da, well, I'll go ahead and print it to show what this will return by default. Uh, if you don't have a specific return value declared in your function, Python will return none. So we will see 7, 12, none, and then we'll also print our uh, add again. So now we should see 7, 12, none, and then 14, because we doubled our input and then we added our input values again. And here we see down here, by my big head, I just realized you guys didn't get any of the stuff that I was talking about. All right, and now that I shrunk my big head, you can see seven, 12, <laughs> none, and 14. So this would be the same code that we created before, but using more of an object-oriented way to do it. Uh, I'm not sure why this would be useful, but this is a good toy example. Uh, I'll go ahead and copy this into a uh, paste bin, and then put that link in the description. All right, devs, thanks for following along this video. I uh, hope you learned more about functional versus object-oriented programming in Python. Uh, definitely like and subscribe if you did, and feel free to check out my blog article on this topic if you want to learn a little bit more. That'll be it for today. See ya.